<laughs> I got a got a notice on my phone just about the time we're getting ready to start that indicated a uh, doctor's appointment tomorrow. Okay, the Word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Yes, all scripture is God-breathed and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that brings us just to a time of prayer. To study the word of God, we need to be clean before the Lord. So that the word of God, when it comes to you, will come through the ear gate, eye gate, tactily for the deaf and blind, and it will go into the frame of reference. When you're clean before the Lord, it will go down into the human spirit where the Holy Spirit is going to teach you. He'll teach you the meaning of the word of God. He'll send that back up to your frame of reference, and you, if you understand what he's been teaching you, then at that point in time, you have the option of believing or disbelieving. Now, if you happen to believe that word, well, that information goes straight down into the clothes closet. New man clothes closet, new ladies clothes closet. You, you choose to take that out of the clothes closet and put it on the launching pad, conscious launching pad. When the circumstance comes along, you choose to apply that. Now, when you've applied that, you have victory in the angelic conflict. You're blessed in time and rewarded in eternity because you're using that in your ambassadorship. Now, with that in mind, what we want is the doctrine that you receive today to flow into, the, uh, into your soul and down to the conscious launching platform so that you can grow spiritually by the application. So with your heads bowed and eyes closed, you make your own way with the Lord through the confession of your own personal sins. Guess what? I'll pray, close out that, uh, that prayer time, I'll make a couple of brief announcements and move right into the teaching of God's word. Heads bowed, eyes closed. You make your own way with the Lord. Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege of studying your word. We're looking at the life of the Apostle Paul, and from that life, we should learn that Christians functioning in the sphere of the Spirit, making pertinent application to the life situation, listen, we're going to receive the same kind of persecution that Paul did. Now, same kind, I don't know that we've thrown in jail, it's possible. Won't, be, won't necessarily be killed, it's possible. Because we're, we're actually functioning in the sphere of the angelic conflict. Nothing makes sense until we understand that. So with that in mind, let us move on to the teaching of, uh, of Luke in the book of Acts. Let us pick up right in chapter 26 where Paul is actually making, bearing witness really, giving testimony about his own life. So with that in mind, Father, we'll pause here just long enough to say amen, move into a couple of announcements, and move on. Okay, folks, let me just make a couple of announcements. Uh, we are going to be studying Acts 26, verses 1 through 5, but I want to make sure that you realize that next Sunday, next Sunday, we'll be back at American Pie Pizza. I have sent out an, uh, the first uh, follow-up inform, uh, information. It's an invitation to come and be a part of this next Sunday. Arrival time is exactly 9.30 to 9.59. We want you in the room before we start at 10 o'clock so that it will not be a distraction. So you can come between 9.30 and 9.59. Class begins at 10 o'clock. We'll finish class at 11 o'clock. We'll be streaming live to Facebook and also uh, to, uh, to WebEx. We'll be streaming live. And then at 11 o'clock, we'll place our orders. And what they want you to have your order again have your order handy when you come through the door. Hand it to your server, and um, you can go to the website. You can go to uh, American Pie Pizza on Maumel Boulevard. You can see the menu there. 
Uh, select your menu, write it down, put your name on it, hand it to the server when you come through the door between 9.30 and 9.59. They'll have us ready to be served around 11.15. Fellowship time, out of there by 12.30. God bless you, and get me information now indicating that you're coming. You can either text me at 501-944-1678 or send an email to me at uh, jbertel at att.com. God bless all of you. Now, let's move into our study. We'll just begin with a brief review, and here's the issue. Paul has finished his three missionary journeys. He was told by some disciples, don't go to Jerusalem. Paul said, no, the Holy Spirit's led me to go to Jerusalem. And so Paul went. We realize that the disciples telling Paul don't go and the Holy Spirit telling Paul to go was simply a test provided by God for Paul. Will you, in fact, go to Jerusalem? Well, he knew that because of his circumstances, no matter where he went, he was going to be persecuted. And so he would have realized that when he goes into Jerusalem now, the same thing is going to happen. Well, we find out that when he got there, and the persecution was there. They hauled him into court. And uh, believe it or not, uh, Felix, the judge at that point, uh, sorry, the, uh, the high priest at that point in time said, hey, look, this guy is innocent. So as we follow the narrative, Paul then, they, they decided in Jerusalem to send Paul up to Caesarea. When he gets to Caesarea, the, uh, the judge at that point in time, the governor judge, was Felix. So we go through this same scenario in the court. We find that, we find that Paul is, uh, is innocent again. Now, as you move the narrative farther, what we find is a man by the name of King Agrippa is going to come to town in Caesarea because Felix has been replaced as governor judge, and Festus has come to town. Festus is in town for three days. He finds Paul here. What in the world's going on here? So he takes a trip down to Jerusalem, 74 miles down to Jerusalem. He goes down there and spends 10 days among the, with a high priest, the Sanhedrin, and he hears some information about Paul that when he goes back, when he goes back to Caesarea, he's got his mind filled with a bunch of garbage about Paul. It's fake news. It's false information. And so he goes back with that information. And now, after 10 days, when he gets back there, King Agrippa comes to town with his, with his sister Bernice, and we've already seen that the Herodian family for four generations is a corrupt, corrupt family. Well, he comes to pay his respects to, uh, to Festus, and while he's there, he said, you know, we get together here, and he tells, tells King Agrippa about... Uh, about Paul's situation, and Paul, remember, has already indicated he does not want to go back to Jerusalem. He's already been found innocent down in Jerusalem. I don't want to go back there. I want to go to Rome. I want to go to Nero. Well, because he was going to go to Nero, really, Festus doesn't have, doesn't have an option. He's got to send him on up to, uh, to, uh, to Rome. He can't send him back there. The Jews in Jerusalem really want him. They want to get rid of him. They want to kill him, get him out of the way. But Festus can't do that. He's got to send him on to, uh, to Rome. However, Agrippa is in town, and so he says, look, King Agrippa, I, I've got this problem. I've got this dilemma. I want you, would you be willing, would you be willing to hear Paul's testimony? He said, certainly. Well, that was a sigh of relief on the part of Festus, uh, on the part of Festus, because he's got to write a report. He feels like he has to write a report to send to Rome, to, to Nero, to tell him why he is sending Paul there. So what happens? Paul is now making his defense. This is the this is the the larger picture of this verses one through five. Paul is getting ready to make his defense, and he's going to make it be, before King Agrippa. Obviously, Festus is there. We've got these people that have come up from Jerusalem. We've got the Sadducees and uh, another group of people that have come up to charge Paul in Caesarea. 
So Paul is making his defense, and he's talking to King Agrippa. Now, in the meantime, Festus is back here gathering information to put in this report that he's going to send along with Paul when he sends him off to Rome. So verse 1, Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and proceeded to make his defense. Now, sort of get the picture. King Agrippa is going to listen to Paul. And King Agrippa is, in fact, he is a king. And so, respectfully, uh, Paul is going to answer him. But what happens is this high, elevated, lofty King Agrippa, he looks at Paul and says, okay, you're permitted to speak for yourself. It says, and Paul raised his hand, stretched his hand, and proceeded his, to make his defense. Well, let's take a look at some of these phrases. When King Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. Well, that sounds okay. But what we need to understand is the tone that he made this in. Hey, I am the king, and uh, I am here uh, to hear you out. Uh, you're going to speak, and by the way, at this point in time, I'm going to allow you to speak. So when he says, you are permitted to speak for yourself, this is a condescending kind of a statement. King Agrippa is acting in a way that shows, hey, I am superior, and I want you to know that. This is my attitude. I know I'm superior, and by the way, I'm going to give you permission to speak. Well, He's permitting Paul to speak as though Paul had no right to do so. So here's Paul standing there in front of the, in front of the king. He wants to give his testimony, and um, King Agrippa is acting like, uh, well, you know, you really don't have the opportunity to speak, or you don't have permission, you don't have the authority, but I'll tell you what, I'm going to give you permission to speak. Well, it says then Paul stretched out his hand. And what that means is he was waving his hand, and that was a sign that he was about to speak. Now, what's the purpose of waving the hand? In that period of time, the purpose of waving the hand is to produce silence and get attention. This gesture is a custom, is, was customary at the beginning of a message at that point in time. Even today, you know, if, uh, if I'm getting ready to, to speak and uh, be... Um, teach a class, and we know that be, before, before 9 o'clock, hey, look, it's fellowship time. It's time to converse and talk with your friends and chat a little while. But when it's time to speak, I may just get up about 10 seconds before uh, 9 o'clock. I'll raise my hand. When I raise my hand, that means, hey, it's time to be quiet because we're about to start to speak. Well, that's exactly what Paul here did here. Agrippa gave him permission to speak, and Paul raised his hand. He's getting ready to speak. And it says he's proceeded to make his defense. Well, Paul's going to make his defense before King Agrippa, and let's try to understand this. This whole phrase, this whole phrase, proceeded to make his defense, is one Greek word, apologetmai. Now, if you're, if you're looking at that on the screen and you happen to see those notes, what you realize is, when you look at that, that almost looks like uh, a word that we, that we know, apologetomai. He's going to make, he's going to make a, a defense, an apology, okay? So this whole phrase is one word, apologetomai, and it means to defend oneself against a charge. Well, Paul's been found innocent in, in Jerusalem. They can't find any, any reason to convict him in uh, in uh, Caesarea because the, the accusations were religious and that was out of the jurisdiction of the Roman Empire. And Festus actually realized that. So he said, oh, throw this case out of court. Well, Paul's beginning to make his defense, but he was not expecting to be released. We need to understand this. Paul is going to make his defense but he's not expecting to, to, to be released from imprisonment because he's already appealed to the Roman emperor. So please just sort of get the idea there. See, when Felix, was, when Felix was in charge before Festus came, remember for a couple of years, Felix put Paul under house arrest. 
he didn't have him in prison where nobody could see him, nobody could get to him. But he, Felix realized that Paul had brought a large offering from the Gentiles in the Asian area as he was on his third missionary journey. He comes back with this large offering, and Felix is saying, uh-oh, uh-oh, this guy has a large amount of money. And if I put him in, in house arrest, we'll let his friends come to him, and maybe if they know that I will let him out of prison and release him, if he gives me some money, Paul stayed in that house arrest. But now what happens here, when he, when he failed under, uh, when they failed to convict him under Festus, this new judge, Paul says, I'm going, to, I'm going to Rome, I'm not going to Jerusalem. So what we need to realize here is Paul is not expecting to get out of prison, get out of jail at this point in time, when he stands up to speak. So we have to ask ourselves this question. Well, if Paul isn't trying to get out of prison, what's, what's his motive? What's he doing here? Well, just understand again, Paul was not expecting to be released from imprisonment because he's already said, I am going to Rome. I'm appealing to Rome. There were several legitimate reasons, though, why Paul wanted to speak to King Agrippa. Jesus has already told Paul, when I, when I commission you one day down the road, you're going to speak before kings and rulers. Up to this point in time, no kings. He hadn't spoken before kings. But here's King Agrippa, and actually he's going to go to Rome and speak before the, the emperor when he gets to Rome. So there are several legitimate reasons why Paul wanted to speak to King Agrippa. First of all, to vindicate his own character. Paul wanted to vindicate his own character. He's been sitting, Agrippa has been listening to Festus, who came, who came back to uh, to Caesarea from Jerusalem with his mind filled with all kinds of accusations. This guy, as far as he was concerned, he was prejudiced toward Paul. He was biased toward Paul because those people down there in Jerusalem had just fed his mind full of all kinds of information that was not true. So Paul is going to try to vindicate his character to King Agrippa. Not, 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 I'm not going to be released, but here it is. I want you to know who I am. So to receive a declaration of innocence from King Agrippa with a possibility of diminishing the anger of his Jewish accusers. His Jewish accusers are right there in front of him. We've got the Sadducees who don't believe in the resurrection. Paul is preaching the resurrection. He's preaching the gospel of grace. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ who died for your sins, was buried, and three days later he came out of the grave. These people were offended at that. So Paul wants, he, he wants to, to, to preach to King Agrippa, to declare the word of God to King Agrippa, with the possibility of diminishing the anger of these Jewish accusers, unbelieving religious Jews. Well, he also had another motive, and that is to get a correct representation of the case that will be sent to Emperor Nero in a report that's coming from Judge Festus. Judge Festus is going to have to write a report. He didn't have to, but he thought, oh, what, listen, if I'm going to do this properly, I've got to send a report up there to tell this guy why I, as the governor, as the judge of this court, why I am doing this. So Paul is preaching to King Agrippa hoping that King Agrippa will see and declare his innocence, and then in this representation of Festus, when he's writing the report to go to, to, go to Emperor Nero, it'll be an accurate report. He also wanted to defend his own conversion. Remember, Paul, is, Paul is an, was, an irreligious, was a religious, unbelieving Jew until he got on the road to Damascus. And just before Damascus, he became, a, he became a believer, a Jew believing that Jesus was the Messiah. Up until that time, Paul is killing these same kind of people. He's not killing Christians. There are no Christians at this point in time. He's killing Messianic Jews, Jews who were religious, 
unbelieving Jews who believed that Jesus was the Messiah, they converted and believed, and they were the real true Jew. They were the true Jews because they were came from the they came from they descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they believed spiritually in the same way that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did. So these were true Jews, but these guys here were not. These were unbelieving religious Jews. And so Paul is defending his own conversion. Agrippa, I was just like these people, but now I have believed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, who died, was buried, and resurrected. I want you to know that that's what I believe. He also gave this uh, his defense to defend the absolute truth of Christianity. See, at this point in time, remember, Paul was converted and became a believing Messianic Jew on the road to Damascus. But when Paul went into Arabian desert, almost immediately after getting saved on the road to Damascus, he went in, yeah, he went into Damascus for a few days. But when he became strong again uh, and was uh, up, to, up to par, had his strength back, off into Arabian desert he goes. And that's where Jesus preaches to him and teaches him the, uh, the, the, the doctrines that we are learning now. They're called the mystery doctrines. They'd never been taught before. So to defend the absolute truth of Christianity, Paul is going to defend that to King Agrippa, and thereby he's going to preach the gospel to Agrippa. He's going to preach the gospel to his attendants. He's going to preach the gospel to Bernice. He's going to give Festus another opportunity. Opportunity to do what? opportunity to be saved. So going back to the point here, Paul proceeds in his defense, and there were several legitimate reasons why Paul wanted to speak to Agrippa. We've just given those. Now in the verse 2, Paul begins his defense. Paul says, in regard to all the things which I am accused by the Jews. <laughs> Stop right there. He says, in regard to all those things, of which I am accused by the Jews. I am a Jew. These guys are accusing me. I was one of them. Here's what he says. He said, I consider myself fortunate. Whoa, how about that? He's standing in front of King Agrippa. He's been accused. He said, I consider myself fortunate. Well, why is he fortunate? King Agrippa, here's why I consider myself fortunate that I am about to make my defense before you, King Agrippa, and I'm going to get to do it today. <laughs> sort of like, so glad you came to town, sir. Now, as Paul began to speak to King Agrippa, note three things. Note three things. When you go back and read this verse, in regard to all things of which I am accused by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I am about to make my defense before you today. Well, as Paul begins this defense, and his defense is going to continue in the next verse, as Paul continues to make his de defense, begins to, note three things about that. First of all, Paul makes no phony start. He makes no phony start. But that means he's, he's not here trying to butter anybody up. He is in no way hypocritical. Paul is not trying to be something other than what he is. See, they think, they think that Paul is, a, um, is biased. They think he's a scoundrel. They think he's, he's upset the Jewish religion. But what Paul is doing here, he's not going to make a phony start. He's not going to butter these people up. He's not going to be a hypocrite. They think, they think he's... A, they think he's a, a scoundrel, and what he's going to do is he's just going to give them the truth. So he offers no false praise for the King Agrippa or for Judge Festus. So no phony start, no hypocrisy, no false praise to these guys. He goes on and says, I consider. Wait a minute. Paul says he considers. Oh, what, what might that mean? What Paul considers is only only what Paul is thinking. He's not going to give Agrippa something that Festus thought, something that 
Felix thought, something the Sadducees thought, something that you might think. No, Paul is going to give Festus exactly what Paul is thinking. Now, the thought that goes through my mind right now is when you find yourself, my oh my, when you find yourself being persecuted, and that day may be coming. As a matter of fact, uh, as a result of this teaching in talking with friends, they have taken from this idea, they've taken this idea of persecution, and they've looked at their own life. They've looked at the lives of people around them, and they see that persecution is not always going to jail. Persecution is not always being whipped. Persecution is not always dying for your faith. But there are, there are needles, the, 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 the satanic barbs that come at you that are the persecution. They may come from a wife, a husband, a, a child, a, a, one of your children. It may come from your boss, your girlfriend, your boyfriend. It may come from whomever. But these little barbs, these are, these are persecutions where you're suffering because of information that's not true about you. So Paul is going to give Agrippa only what he is thinking. And what Paul thinks is important in his defense. Listen to that. What Paul thinks is important in his defense. You see, the content of Paul's thinking is going to be doctrinally sound. Now, guess what? The content of your, the content of your defense at any time in the future, whether it's a little thing or a big thing, the content of your defense needs to be doctrinally sound. And if you have no doctrine, or if you have too little doctrine, and by the way, I'm, I'm considering tomorrow, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow evening, Monday night Bible class, we're going to continue in Acts chapter 26. We should be able to go to Acts 26, verse 6 and following. But what I intend to do tomorrow night is I've been draw, drawing a diagram. And the diagram has to do with learning what it means to be able to live inside the green circle, which is the sphere of the spirit. What, what it might mean to have the attitude that we as Christians might need to have, that we need to have, that makes the difference between coming to Bible class and being a religious, believing Christian, a Christian as opposed to a believing, experientially spiritual Christian. I've got a diagram because the burden of my heart, please listen, the burden of my heart is similar to what Paul was going through when he, as an unbelieving religious Jew, going through the religious motions of the Mosaic Law, but because, because he, he was an unbeliever, it was getting him nothing to be that unbelieving religious Jew, even though he was doing everything he was supposed to do. But I've, I've mentioned time and time again, it's not a matter of just doing. It's a matter of doing the right thing in the right way. And today, I am convinced that Christian after Christian after Christian after Christian, denominationally, sect-wise, independent-wise, are living a religious, believing Christian life that is absolutely of no effect to them because they have not been able to make the transition between being religiously spiritual, if I could say it that way, and experientially spiritual. Because a religious believer going through the motions is still going to be disturbed in their inner life because they know and understand this is not reality. Remember the angelic conflict? So Paul is indicating here that the doctrinal content of what he's going to tell to Agrippa is actually doctrinally correct. This means then that for you and I, as born-again Christians, whenever we are under persecution, whether it is minimal 
or whether it is severe, that we stand and give doctrinally sound testimony. What Paul is considering here, what Paul is considering, he says, Paul says, I consider. Well, what he's considering is absolutely doctrinally sound. This is an absolute conclusion. Okay, now, with that in mind, let's move on here. Paul said, I consider myself fortunate. The word for fortune here is makarios, makarios, and it means happy. Now, I'm not sure whether all those that are online with me right now have ever heard this before, so I want to go ahead and give this information for, for you to understand that if you're reading the Bible and you run into the word happy, you need to understand what kind of happiness that is. Because to be doctrinally sound, you need to understand that there, the, word doc, the word happy in the Bible is used in three different ways. So you can, in fact, be happy, and you can tell your wife, your husband, your friend, you could tell the preacher, the deacons, you could tell your boss, I am happy. Well, what kind of happiness are you talking about? Because I, we're going to categorize happiness in three ways. In the, first, in the first sense, we're going to call that minus H. H stands for happy. This is a form of happiness that we call minus H. Then there is a neutral H because there is no plus or minus sign attached to it. Thirdly, there is a plus H. So we have three kinds of happiness spoken of in the Bible. Minus H, neutral H, plus H. Now the question is, what kind of happiness are these? Because Paul is going to indicate that he is fortunate. He is makarios. He is happy. He is happy to be able to do what he's doing. Well, what kind of happiness does Paul have? Well, first of all, minus H means there is pleasure in sin for a season. For example... You may, be, uh, you may know that promiscuity, you may know that sex before marriage is, is sinful. Fornication, that's sinful. You know that the sexual relationship outside of marriage, having sexual relationship with someone other than your wife, that's sinful, that's adultery. You know that, that getting drunk is, uh, drunkenness is sin. Drunkenness is sin. Drinking is not sin. Drunkenness is sin. So what happens is, okay, you go out and you, you, you fornicate tonight. Man, I, I need, I, I'm, I'm in need of sexual contact tonight. So you as, a, as a, a, an unbeliever, or I mean as a, as a Christian, outside of, uh, outside of wedlock, you're not married, you go out and have a sexual relationship. Ooh, boy, I'm satisfied now. Happy as a pig in slop. Look what I did. I, I, ooh, uh, that's minus H. That happiness is temporary. It will not last. So the drunken spree, the drug spree, the fix, who know, what is it? Whatever it happens to be, it's sinful. It is pleasure in sin for a season. So you tell people, yes, I'm happy, but tomorrow morning, and a week later, you don't have that happiness. This kind of happiness is fleeting. Happiness for the moment. Pleasure and sin for a season. There is another form of happiness. And that's what I'm calling establishment happiness. Now, again, you have to understand that every one of us are involved in the angelic conflict. But in order to, to provide the kind of uh, the background for life, for man, you, me, I, we, as human beings, to resolve the spiritual battle called the angelic conflict, there have to be some guidelines. So God has given us five guidelines to establish the, the, the capacity to be able to do in life what we need to do to resolve the angelic conflict. So there are five establishment principles that come from God. And this is just so life can be lived. You hear time and time again, uh, one, of the, one of the candidates, Demo Democrat candidates for president, is telling us and was telling us, within the next two weeks, the next short period of time, if we don't get this, this uh, stuff right, the world is going to come to an end. I say, eh, wrong. 
you better leave, you better read the Bible. Man is not going to to destroy himself because God has people on this planet who are going to believe Him and they're going to live by the five divine establishment principles: freedom, marriage, family, nationalism, supporting free market capitalism, and employment. There are the five. Now, what happens is. You see, you can be you can be married as an unbeliever and be happy, but it's it's neutral age, it's happiness because things are going well for you in marriage. You can have a job and like your job. You can be happy because of that, but that happiness is not the kind of happiness that God is looking for. Certainly, He's looking for that. He's not looking for minus age, but He is looking for plus age. And plus H is the happiness that belongs to God. God is a happy God. And that kind of happiness that, that is, comprises the character of Almighty God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all three of them have this kind of happiness. It's an inner happiness. And that happiness is the kind of happiness that comes to you and me for being saved, clean before the Lord through confession of post-salvation sins, and advancing from babyhood to spiritual adolescence, to spiritual self-esteem, to spiritual autonomy, and then on to spiritual maturity. Obviously, your happiness will maximize. It'll be maximum when you reach spiritual maturity, which is, in fact, a reachable goal in this life. You don't have to wait till you go off into, into eternity to find spiritual maturity. You can be spiritual, spiritually mature here. So when you reach spiritual self-esteem, first level of spiritual adulthood, you begin to experience this plus age. As you move and advance to spiritual autonomy, standing on your own two feet, you're growing, you're increasing your capacity for inner happiness. You reach spiritual maturity. And now you have, the, you have maximized inner happiness. No matter what comes along, you're going to be exactly like the Apostle Paul. Paul is going to speak to King Agrippa, and when he's speaking to King Agrippa, knowing that he's still, he's still, still, he's still a prisoner, he's going to be a prisoner all the way to Rome. He's going to speak before Nero, the emperor, but in all of this transition, all this going on, Paul has inner happiness, and that is, what's the value of studying this passage today? It's to show you that under persecution-type circumstances, you too, I too, we too, can be exactly like Paul is doing here. So that as you're growing in Christ, you're applying the Word of God, doing the right thing in the right way. The more you do this, the more you maximize your inner happiness. Oh, you can be, you can have, you can have inner happiness at spiritual self-esteem when you break into spiritual, spiritual adulthood. But you don't have it all. There are still some things that you don't know, you haven't learned, you haven't applied. So you have a minimum of, of this inner happiness. You move on to spiritual, spiritual autonomy, you grow in that. You move on to maturity, you maximize it. There's never a time or occasion when you are not having this inner happiness. This is a part of God's plan for you and me in the angelic conflict because when you look out and you see, uh, you come to Bible class and say, well, how's it going? He says, well, the battle rages, the battle rages. I, yeah, that's right, it does. The battle rages. The battle is raging on all fronts. You're fighting, the, you're fighting the flesh. You're fighting the devil. You're fighting evil. You're fighting these things, fighting them in the sense that you, these things are opposing you every moment of the day. So the question is, what is your attitude? If you find yourself bickering, if you find yourself unhappy, if you find yourself complaining, marabouring, like the Jews in the wilderness, there's still something wrong. This hasn't been righted in your life. Now, that's not an accusation. I'm not criticizing. I'm trying to objectively show you where you are in your Christian way of life. Because if you're belly aching about anything, I'm saying anything, you have not yet reached this point where you have the happiness that Paul had. And this is the goal line. 
This is a goal line for us. Inner happiness no matter what the circumstance of life. Now, Paul has some options here. And what you know, what you realize is these, these options that Paul has are the same options that you and I have under any circumstance of life. I stop right there. I stop right there. Why am I stopping? It's to give you an opportunity to think about what I just said. These are your options. These are my options under any A. N Y A L L under all circumstances of life. Whether you have made the bad decision or someone is persecuting you, where you have pressure in your life, pressure that comes from God because you reach spiritual self esteem and you're going to receive Paul's thorn in the flesh test. And the question how are you going to face that test? Every test in life can be faced exactly like Paul does. So here's the issue. Paul has some options. I've got three options here. One and three are the, are the, the results. Let's look at these. I want to start with option number two, right here in the, cent, in the center. And what I want you to do is to read down that list. What does that mean? Paul's options. This is a look at Paul's soul. Paul's soul is exactly like yours. Every human being has a soul. Your soul is going to live forever. It'll either live forever with Christ, with God the Father in heaven, or it will live in the lake of fire forever. It's either banished forever or with God forever. The options are yours. So what happens, Paul gave, God gave us a soul. And when, we, when you look at that soul, I've got a white screen there for the soul. And what that means is looking at your soul, your soul is neutral. Your soul doesn't have an opinion. Your, at this point, your soul is neutral. The question is, which way is your soul going to yield? Is your soul, soul going to yield to the left, to the gray, to the gray column? Or is your soul going to, going to yield to the right, to the green column? In the left side, notice this. In the left side, under number one, the soul focus, you are a carnal believer there. You're out of fellowship with God. You're not building any credit with God. There are no blessings in time. There are no rewards, rewards in eternity. You lose everything when you're functioning right there. We call this minus H. When you're functioning in carnality, you may have sin, pleasure in sin for a season. This is because of your carnality. You're out of fellowship with God. You're out of fellowship with God because you're doing something wrong. You're not doing the right thing. And you're not doing it in the right way. So you, you may have some happiness, but that is minus H, pleasure in sin for a season. Because of this, carnality, you are functioning from your old man or your old woman, and F, S slash F means you're functioning in the sphere of the flesh. You're functioning under, the, under the, uh, the leadership, the guidance of your old sin nature. What is the soap focus? Let's come back over to the middle column. This is, the, this is your, your neutral soul. In a neutral soul, you can have, you can have establishment happiness. Look here, when you're, functioning, when you're functioning in neutrality, you're functioning as a, from your neutral man or neutral woman. You're functioning in the sphere of neutrality. This is where objectively you're going to make a decision. You're going to make a decision to go left or you're going to make a decision to go right. You're going to function in carnality or you're going to function in the sphere of the spirit. Your, your neutral soul you have self-consciousness, which makes you aware of yourself. Mentality, this is where you do your thinking. Volition, this is where you make your choices. Emotion, this is where you get your feelings. Conscience, this is where you have your norms and standards. So let's go back to the top of the list now, because Paul has inner happiness. This is your choice, one direction or another, 24 hours a day. 
seven days a week, 30, 31 days a month. In a year's time, you have the capacity to be functioning and you will function in any one of these three spheres at, one, uh, at, at a, any given point in time. So going down the list, this is your neutral soul. That neutral soul is going to make a decision, and it's going to have a soul focus. So when you, when you focus over here, you go negative. Here's what happens. You move from neutrality to carnality. You move from just inner ha to, uh, to um, establishment happiness to happiness for a season. You were functioning from your neutral man and the sphere of neutrality. You function now from your old man and the sphere of the flesh. Your self-consciousness gives you the capacity to understand and know yourself. When you're carnal, you're functioning, you're functioning, you're, you, yourself, you are the object. You are the, the focus of your life. You. Mentality, you're filled with human viewpoint. Volition, you're filled with negative volition. These are where you make your negative decisions to get into carnality. Your emotions are negative. You're angry, you're bitter, you're jealous, you're vindictive, and your conscience is filled with human viewpoint norms and standards that are worthless to you. Okay, let's take the neutral soul here, and you make the decision to go the other direction, over to the right. Now what happens is you become experientially spiritual as opposed to carnal. You now have inner happiness. Why do you have inner happiness? It's because you're functioning from the new man, the new woman, or from the sphere of the spirit. Your focus is not on yourself now. Your focus in everything about your life is focused on Christ. It's a decision. You make a decision to go in that direction. Mentality, your mentality now is filled with divine viewpoint. Those are the principles, promises, doctrines, techniques, rules for living that are guiding the Christian way of life from the word of God, given to us by God the Father. Volition, this is positive volition. This is when you're directed toward the plan of God for your life. Your emotions are, are positive. See, over here, on the negative side, you're angry, you're bitter, you're jealous. Over here, the positive, you're happy, you're rejoicing. Your conscience is filled with divine viewpoint. Now, notice again. <clears throat> yes, Paul was in prison. He's been in prison in, in Caesarea for over two years just being held in prison under house arrest. But guess what? He has inner happiness. Let's make an application here. Paul's options are your options. And the question is, which column you're going to live in? Are you going to live in column number one, <clears throat> where you're going to live a carnal life? Your happiness is limited through sin, uh, happiness and sin for a season. You're functioning from your old man and spirit of the flesh. Your focus is on yourself. You have human viewpoint. You're negative toward the planet of God. You have negative emotions, and you're filled with human viewpoint. Over here, you make the decision to go to the right. You're living in the green circle. You experientially spiritual life. This is where God wants you to live. You have inner happiness. You're functioning from your new man, new woman, sphere of the spirit. Your focus is on Christ. Divine viewpoint is what you're holding in your mind. You have, you're functioning a positive volition toward the plan of God. You have positive emotions, and your conscience is based on divine viewpoint. Which column are you living in, column one or column three? Paul says, I make my defense. Apologetomai. Paul is not going to mention, listen, Paul is not going to mention the accusations of them believing religious Jews. He's not going to do that. He's going to be positive. Why is he going to do this? Because those accusations were set aside in a previous court. He doesn't have to go down that road again. He's already been found innocent. Down in Jerusalem, they couldn't accuse him in Caesarea. Well, Paul is poised and objective. Now go back here. Which column are you living in? One or three? Paul is living in three, so Paul is going to be poised and objective. Acts 26.3, especially because you, King Agrippa, Paul continues his defense. He said he's happy 
because he's talking to King Agrippa, especially because, watch this, you are an expert in all customs and questions of the Jews. Paul is not buttering this guy up. This guy is a Jew. King Agrippa is a Jew. We've mentioned a little bit about that in one of the previous lessons, but he was a Jew. So Paul is telling him, look, I'm glad to give my testimony before you because you are a person who is an expert in Jewish customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, based upon that fact, he said, I beg you, I beg you to listen to me patiently. That word patiently means with indulgence. I'm going to give you a testimony. I'm going to speak and speak and speak and speak. Indulge me. Listen. Hear me out. Consider Paul in this situation. Paul is, in fact, poised. He's objective. And his poise and objectivity is based on the application of the doctrine risen his soul. Because Paul has maximum doctrine in his soul, he's able to be poised. He's not upset. He's not bitter. He's not resentful. He's not trying to pull his punches. He's, he's not trying to be politically correct. He's poised. He's objective in his presentation. Two, the application of pertinent doctrine resonant in Paul's soul gives him inner perfect happiness. Perfect inner happiness. I mean, he's standing before the king. I, I think often, I like to watch uh, uh, America's Got Talent, and when they when they get up and they get somebody comes out and they're getting ready to sing that somebody one of the judges say are you nervous he says yeah, yeah, yeah I'm nervous I'm nervous well I understand that Paul is just the opposite of that Paul has perfect inner happiness he's going to use he's going to use his inner happiness and he's going to be courteous to King Agrippa he's going to be poised in everything he says to him as he opens his defense well here's an application. Paul is, has inner happiness, he's courteous, he's poised. Here's an application. If you're functioning within the sphere of the Spirit, please listen. If you're functioning in the sphere of the Spirit, question, where are you right now? You can be in the sphere of the Spirit and should be even right now. But if you're functioning there, you can be courteous, you can be poised, in any pressure situation because you know, listen to me please, you know that God is in control of the circumstance and he has designed your circumstance just for you at that moment in time. If I'd have started with that right there and closed with that right there, that's all would need to be said. You say, well, why didn't you do it? Because there is more here. But listen, if you're functioning, so today, tomorrow, the next day, the next day, the next day, it's near 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 13 o'clock if you're in the Navy. What, No matter what time it is, no matter what day of the week, if you are functioning in the sphere of the Spirit, you can be courteous and poised in any pressure situation because you know that God permitted, God is in control of your circumstance. He has placed you there. Saying God's in control of the circumstance, that doesn't mean he's controlling you. God is controlling the circumstance and has permitted this since eternity past as a test for Paul as a test to you to find out if you'll be courteous, if you'll be poised, if you'll be objective in that situation where you're going to use your volition one way or another to be poised or upset. Point four, a common mistake among many Christians today. Some believe that when you have a need, oh God, I've got this need out here. Give me what I need, Lord. Some believe that when you have a need, the Holy Spirit will inject into your mind the appropriate thing to say. 
That notion is categorically wrong. The Holy Spirit is not going to put in your head something that you don't already have there. So it is the residual doctrine. That means the doctrine that you have learned, it came in, ear gate, eye gate, tackily. It's gone all the way down to the human spirit, back up. It's down, on, it's down now on the conscious launching platform. That's residual doctrine. It is the residual doctrine already resident in the soul that the Holy Spirit's going to use. So when you find yourself in a circumstance of pressure, a pressure circumstance, if you don't have the pertinent doctrine risen in your soul, you're going to lose at that point in time. What are you going to lose? You're going to lose your spirituality. You're going to lose your experiential spirituality. You're going to become carnal. You're going to be hauling out a divine viewpoint. You're going to rationalize this thing away. So understand that Holy Spirit's not going to jam anything into your head. You either have it or you don't. Now, let's move on from there. The Holy Spirit will use the doctrine already resident in Paul's soul when he speaks to King Agrippa. That's why he can be happy. Point five. This is the Christian way of life. See, this is what it's all about. The belief that Christians don't have to study the Bible, and all, they ha all that has to be done is to stand around and wait for the Holy Spirit to give you something to say, that is a ridiculous thought. Principle. Here's a principle in life. Three principles, in fact. If you don't have pertinent doctrine already resident in your soul, when you open your mouth to speak, nothing of value will come out. That doesn't say nothing will come out. That says nothing of value will come out. Remember, the value is related to resolving the spiritual battle called the angelic conflict. Second principle, God the Holy Spirit does not and cannot use what you do not have. Holy Spirit can't use what you don't have. <laughs> it must already be resonant in the mentality of your soul. Principle number three, you will never use all the doctrine you have in your soul at any given time. You're not going to apply the whole thing. <laughs> The only way you could do this is if you only had one principle or one promise. Well, I've used it all. No, as you have grown, use a, a, as you've grown to understand the Word of God, you will never use all of it at one time. So Paul is operating on doctrinal resi uh, on residence as re as residual doctrine. Let me say that again. Paul is operating before King Agrippa. He's operating on residual doctrine. Now, we're at point four here, verse four here now, and uh, let, me go ahead and, let me go ahead in the last three or four minutes, uh, go to this verse, and we'll leave verse five for tomorrow night, okay? Paul says, all Jews know. What did all Jews know? It's improbable that Paul distinguished himself, it, it is improbable that Paul distinguished himself in the school of Gamaliel for his zeal in the Jewish religion. It is not improbable. What that means is when Paul was born, he was born in, Tar in Tarsus. Early in his life, he went, to, he went to Jerusalem to study under Gamaliel. And Gamaliel was, was the, the utmost of teachers of the Jewish religion. Paul went there and studied under him. So when he says all Jews knew, this is all Jews. Every Jew knew about, knew about me. It's not improbable that Paul distinguished himself in the school of Gamaliel for his zeal in the Jewish religion. So while he's in school, he was one of those students that said, man, look at the zeal of this guy. Man, he's, he's got it. So the fact that he, has, he was entrusted with a commission against the Messianic Jews is evidence that Paul was well known. So he established himself in the school and we see these Messianic Jews in Jerusalem, and they're messing things up. They're saying, Jesus, this human guy over here, he, he's the Messiah. No, he isn't. So because of his zeal, people knew him. And that's why it, he was given and entrusted with a commission to go out there and get these guys, get rid of them. Who else might have known Paul's early life? Paul could reference the Messianic Jews. Hey, you go, go ask them about me. Boy, they'll, they'll give you some information. 
Paul could also appeal to the men who had been his violent accusers. So he said, these Jews, they know my manner of life. This refers to Paul's opinions, his principles, and his conduct. They know that. Which from the beginning, this is the early part of Paul's life, the time when he was forming his opinions, he was forming his habits. And he said, that was from my youth up. Paul was born in Tarsus, but early in that period, he had been sent to Jerusalem for the purpose of getting an education in the school of Gamaliel. Now, in verse 5, if they are willing to testify, we'll pick up that tomorrow night right here. I think what we need to take away from this is we're learning what Paul did, how he handled persecution under the greatest of trials. Now, look here. If, if, you, could, if you can handle if you can handle the greatest of trials, something like Paul's going through, obviously you can handle the mosquito. Paul is handling the, ele- the elephants rushing at him here. But you learn to handle the elephant by learning how to handle the mosquito. Okay? So, Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege of taking a look at Paul's life, giving testimony, bearing witness in court, and being objective and poised and courteous while doing so, we need to learn this and use it, apply it. People around us, looking at us, watching us, they'll see this kind of a testimony and say, "My, I can't do that. How's this person doing this? And then you have the opportunity to share with them the wonderful gospel of grace and give them information on how they can grow into Christ-likeness. Why? all because it's about resolving the angelic conflict. I pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Now let me go back here for just one more thing very quickly. Let me go back one more thing here. I want to come back and indicate to you next Sunday now, Monday night, Wednesday night, the same. But next Sunday, it'll be 10 o'clock. We'll start at 10 o'clock at American Pie Pizza on Maumel Boulevard here in this area and go from 10 to 11 study on WebEx, Facebook, and then have lunch from 11 to 1230. God bless all of you. If you're local here, you plan to come, please get me some information and get it to me quickly. I have to make some reservations. God bless you and good day.